everyone to the uh, fundamentals session and uh, I'm really excited that uh, we have uh, such an outstanding uh, list of topics and in, in fundamentals. For those of you I have not met, my name is Mark Stefka and I'm with a couple different organizations. I'm one of the, uh, my full-time job is with uh, General Motors and I'm also adjunct faculty at uh, University of Michigan Dearborn and University of Detroit Mercy. And most importantly, I've been very fortunate that I was asked to serve as the EMC Society Education Chair, which is uh, really great because in, in that particular role, I'm able to, to, help, uh, to help contribute towards the, the education of uh, education f events like this at the symposium. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, and uh, uh, this is Mr. Lee Hill. And Lee is uh, a found founding partner of the company Silent. He has a MSEE from Missouri uh, University of Science and Technology. And he's also a member, he's also adjunct fa faculty member at the Worcester, Worcester? Yeah, there we go. Worcester. Worcester, there we go. Uh, Polytechnic <laughs> Institute. And uh, he is also an EMC course instructor at the University of Oxford. And Lee will bring a, a lot of uh, background and theory as well as applications to this particular topic. So with that, Lee. Thanks, Mark. Everybody hear me OK in the back? All right, thank you, John. So I want to thank you guys for uh, turning out first thing this morning. Uh, for a talk, sometimes I can't make the 8 or 8.30 sessions I want to, but my body says sleep, sleep, so I never make it. No matter how good the speaker is, I don't make it. Mark, thanks for inviting me to give this presentation again. Um, it, I, I was very, very lucky to have Mark ask me to do the fundamentals again this year, and um, he reminded me that I did something last year. I, I acknowledged you know, the, the great uh, opportunity he gave me. Um, the opportunity that Mark gave me for the fundamentals presentation was to cover Maxwell's equations, Ampere's law, Faraday's law, how it defines inductance, current flows and path of least impedance, how resistance at DC and least impedance high frequencies and where the transition occurs, boundary conditions and how the required electric fields to be zero on the perfect electric conduct, and a number of other things, and then he gave me one hour. Thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And I, I, I accepted the task, so as a result, uh, here I am. So I'll, I'll do my best to uh, hit on a couple of those uh, topics in the next hour. Whenever I give a talk on EMC, I like to have um, demonstration tools. I like to have things to play with to show how things work. It's really hard for me to give a talk on electromagnetic interference uh, without having some show and tell items. So I hope that you enjoy those. Um, please ask me questions during the presentation. Um, it, it is a very finite amount of time, but it's much more fun when people say something. My worst nightmare is a very quiet class where I hear crickets, you know, and nobody's talking. I don't know what people are thinking. So if you have a question, um, I know you're supposed to go up to the microphone, but if it's right in the middle of a thought and I'm saying something that doesn't make any sense, if you raise your hand, I will get you, okay? Um, it, there will be, a, there, there's going to be no time right at the end of my presentation for questions because at um, 9.30 sharp, Todd Hubing is going to come up and start speaking. So uh, we should just plan for questions during the talk. So please don't be shy. Raise your hand. i uh, be glad to hear from you. Okay. So with that, let's get started. So a quick line, a quick outline. Uh, we're going to talk about emissions. That was in the topic for today. Um, if you have, if you have uh, radiated emissions in particular, you have to be able to find three things. If you're troubleshooting a radiated emissions problem, uh, you need to be able to find at least one of those three things to start off with. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, we need to obviously find a source. Um, digital electronic circuits are our favorite source of radiated emissions. Uh, they'll have some currents. Often they'll be flowing through an inductance. We don't see on the schematic, and that leads to a, um, that leads to a, a connection to an antenna. So we actually need a source. Uh, we're going to talk about in a second, we need a path and we need an antenna for radiated emissions. If you're troubleshooting a radiated emissions problem, you need to find the antenna. Usually the most helpful thing is to find the antenna. If you have no idea of the source even, finding the antenna will often help you find your way back to the source. So that begs the question, what does an antenna look like? We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we're going to talk about inductance since we're saying that inductance is often the way that that we, we create a path from a source to an antenna, or the inductance is the mechanism which creates a noise voltage which then appears on a part of our schematic we hadn't planned on, and that voltage then, then drives an antenna structure. 
We're going to talk a little bit about Maxwell's equations, and I'll give you a, uh, a physical uh, demonstration of, of uh, a couple of Maxwell's equations, Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Um, we'll use our favorite tool, um, the, the current probe. I forgot to ask when I got started here, even though it was written down on my notes and I'm supposed to pay attention to, how many of you, uh, just out of curiosity, this is your first time coming to an IEEE EMC symposium? You heard, I just want to make sure I said the right thing. How many of you, this is the first time you have come to an IEEE EMC symposium? Okay, outstanding. That is, um, that should make uh, the organizers very happy. Thank you all for coming for the first time. I hope this starts off a good impression <laughs> for the EMC symposium. Great. Um, how many of you are, uh, how many of you are part-time, most of the time, uh, have responsibility for addressing EMC, either in design or troubleshooting. How many of you really have EMC in your job description? Okay, L and then I'm going to stop asking questions because you came to listen to me. Okay, L last one is um, how many of you are from uh, you know roughly the Bay Area? So probably more than half of you have traveled. Okay, that's impressive. Thank you. That, that's, that's awesome information. Um, also, public speaking 101 is knowing your audience. So now I know my audience a lot better. Otherwise, I'm just jabbering up here, which I do anyway. Okay. So let's talk about the noise model. How do we think about, uh, how do we think about uh, noise? Um, we have, so this is, the th this is the way that I think about all noise problems that I was taught in school. Most of you have not been taught this in school, and that's why noise problems are so frustrating. Every noise problem has source, path, and uh, a victim in the most general kind of construct. If we're worried about radiated emissions, we must have a source, we must have a path, and we must have an antenna. Um, many times, if you're facing a radiated emissions problem, you will have an idea of what the source is. Yeah, 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 it's a, a five gigahertz problem, and my fundamental is one gigahertz, and you, you count up with integers, and yeah, you, you know the, what the source is. Um, you know that when a particular cable is plugged in, or when, uh, when the, a particular cable is plugged in, the radiated emissions are there, and then you unplug the cable, and the emissions go away. Yeah, you kind of know what the intent is. What most of our clients at my company have trouble with still today is path. Okay, we're going to spend a little bit, a tiny bit of time about PATH today in the um, Clayton Paul Global University section I'm teaching, that I'm teaching and presenting in. I'll talk a lot more about PATH because that's, that's critical to, to completely describing and, and solving a, an EMI problem. So source, PATH, and antenna for uh, radiated emissions. If your problem has radiated emissions, you've got to have a source, you've got to have a PATH to connect that source to an antenna. And you, you got to have an antenna. We're going to talk about antennas a little bit more. But if I take the antenna away, there's no radiated emissions problem. If I take the source away, there's no problem. If I take away the path, there's no problem. Um, so having a physical uh, feeling for what antennas look like is obviously going to be very helpful. So first, we're going to talk about uh, simple sources, uh, periodic digital signals. Um, and particularly the, the current associated with uh, a periodic digital signal flowing through a loop. Um, that loop, uh, the, the self-inductance is not s shown on the schematic. It might be in a SPICE model or an IBIS model, but if I'm just looking at a flat schematic, um, the actual loop inductances that are parts of ordinary, of every signal loop on your schematic, that inductance isn't shown. But that's only partially interesting. <laughs> it's a little, What's more interesting is maybe how that current couples to another circuit through a mutual inductance, through a, a sharing of, of magnetic flux. Um, so if we have a signal loop on a circuit board that somehow shares a little bit of its magnetic stuff, as I like to create, call it, when back in high school you all learned the right-hand rule, current flows down your thumb, something rotates around your thumb, that's the magnetic flux. We're interested in is how does that first circuit share stuff with the second circuit. If we have a, a mutual coupling into an antenna circuit, now, we've, now we can see a voltage connected to an antenna. We induce a voltage into the antenna circuit. Now we can drive some currents out onto an antenna. Um, so another current that could be the source of a radiated emission uh, associated with periodic digital signals would be uh, a current associated with the power bus. Um, we, we, uh, we have these digital circuits that turn on and off with time. And if the impedance of our power bus isn't exactly zero, then we expect to see a little bit of voltage across the power bus. There's a whole uh, area of, of um, 
of, of knowledge in the area of power integrity and trying to keep that voltage down below a certain number, which often correlates to try to keeping that impedance down small enough uh, over a wide frequency range. But here's a way that currents flowing in and out of the chip can create a voltage across a couple of pieces of metal, a, a power and ground, power and zero volt structure, which is then maybe connected to wires or connected to other circuit boards, physical things that, that can become antennas. So just a very high level, kind of just breezing past um, the sorts of things that we expect to be our sources um, for, for radiated emissions. And um, after sources for radiated emissions, sometimes we get radiated emissions. So this is uh, just a quick breeze by of um, one of our customers. They were failing uh, radiated emissions at a couple of, a couple of different frequencies, the, the markers that are above the bad red line there. And uh, they look regularly spaced. So um, that's maybe the reason to talk about radiated emissions theory is to understand how to make these problems go away. So, um, a very quick review on, on periodic signals, on digital signals. For some of you uh, recently out of school, this will be boring. For some of you, it'll be a review. I'm hoping to provide something for each one of you that is maybe new or uh, something that's brush, brushing off some cobwebs. So some of this will be very uh, straightforward for you. Um, I had a professor a long time ago in school. He taught my signals and systems class. He said the same thing over and over and over again, one of those old guys with marbles in his mouth. He would say, every class he would say, you can build any periodic signal. So you can build any periodic signal. He would say it over and over again as a sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals. He would say that over and over again. Uh, what did he mean by uh, fundamental signals? Sine waves, right? Exponentials, right? Uh, cleverly chosen. What did he mean by cleverly chosen? He meant the right amplitude, the right frequency, and the right phase. And if we take the right amplitude, the right frequency, and the right phase, we put those in a, in a bucket and we stir around, all of a sudden out pops a representation of the, the periodic signal that, that we want, right? Build any periodic signal as a sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals. So let me pick some cleverly chosen fundamental signals. I'm going to pick some sine waves, and, as I, and I'm going to pick uh, some discrete frequencies. So I'm going to use n as, the, as my uh, harmonic number here, right? And then I'm also going to, as I increase the harmonic number, I'm going to decrease the amplitude. So I'm going to take one, two, three fundamental signals here. Notice I've chosen odd integer numbers, one, three, and five, right? And, I'm going to, and then I'm going to add them all up, mathematically and then graphically. So I'm just going back to your class on Fourier series and saying, OK, uh, let's take the first harmonic. Here's the black. Black one is number one. Some of you are going, oh my gosh, I hope it gets interesting soon. One, one uh, fundamental, and then here's three times the fundamental in blue and five times the fundamental in green. And, and you see the amplitude gets smaller with frequency. If I go and add those all up, if I take each, the three values at each point on the x-axis, and I add them up, even with just number one, number three, and number five, we start to see something that looks like a square wave. If I were to convert these samples, you see I took uh, i as an index value, and when i gets to 100, I get 2 pi times n, which looks like the, the right formula, right? Uh, if I change this to, f to time, and I make that 100 uh, nanoseconds, now what I've got is a, is a 10 megahertz square wave. You say, wow, look at that, just three harmonics and I've got a square wave. But, but if you're doing design verification testing on this and you look at this edge, the time it takes a signal to go from max to minimum, uh, that's kind of slow. That's not a very respectable looking signal. Everybody wants that to be faster. Nobody wants a 20 nanosecond edge rate, 20 megahertz square, right? It's too slow. So how are we gonna make it faster? We're gonna add, we're gonna add more harmonics, right? So let's add number seven to the mix. Let's add number nine to the mix. Now we have, if it was a 10 megahertz square wave, now we have 10, 30, 50, 70, 90, and now we look at the edge and we go, oh, that's a little bit better, right? Um, and so EMC engineers have been taught that all the high frequency energy is in the higher order harmonics. So right after we're born, somebody whispers in our ear, low pass filter, slow down the edge rate, get rid of the high frequencies, right? We're taught that from scratch, but, but pay attention here, uh, you already are, of course, Look, 
with the first nine harmonics, we're starting to get that something that looks like an acceptable square wave, right? What if we were to low pass filter this signal? What if we were to try to fix our 50 megahertz radiated emissions problem? It could, some people still have those, right? It's possible. What if we were trying to fix our 50 megahertz low pass, fix our 50 megahertz radiated emissions problem with a low pass filter? With a traditional low pass filter, with the pole low enough to, to chop off the fifth harmonic, we've also reduced the amplitude of the seventh and the ninth, right? Here's a fundamental decision in, in EMI troubleshooting. Can I fix the problem by, by filtering the source? If it's harmonic number five, right, what I'm going to be back to is a signal that looks worse than the one on the right. Because that's got the full amplitude of the fifth harmonic, right? And it looks miserable in terms of edge rate. So, a, so uh, as a reminder, we when we're tro doing EMI troubleshooting, we can't completely discard all the, the, those fundamental classes back in school. We've got to remember what we need to create a decent looking square wave in time, if we care about square waves to, to operate a digital circuitry. Then low pass filtering at low harmonic numbers doesn't usually make much sense. It's a dumb idea. It's a bad branch to take in your troubleshooting path. Because if you think you can slow down the signal enough to affect the amplitude of the fifth harmonic, well, you're not going to like what's going to show up on the oscilloscope and maybe a circuit's not going to work. All of those were maybes, perhaps, right? But just as, just as a, a quick takeaway from this. Another takeaway from this is um, back in school, when you had your digital signals uh, or, or uh, signals in systems class where you got taught Fourier series, um, <coughs> Maybe the professor taught you Fourier series and the representation of square waves, uh, digital square waves, as a summation of odd harmonics only. Right? And that's what I did too. Nobody raised their head and said, wait a minute, what happened to the evens? When you get test data from a radiated emissions test lab or a conducted emissions test lab, when you see the even harmonics on the test data, do you, do you, do you call a lab and say, those aren't mine, I, I only have odd harmonics. You, you picked up the wrong signal. That's not me. I passed <laughs> at the even heart. I don't have even harmonics, thank you. Wait a minute. What? I just told the same story, right? Let's go and take a look at that in a, in a minute here. So we're going to build a square wave. Uh, so we talked about one, three, five, seven, nine. Um, uh, now, really, it's, it's, it's the, the sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals, right? We're, we're, let's, I'm going to go out of order here just for fun. Uh, the sum. When we take the sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals, that's what this simplification looks like here, we're supposed to go to infinity. Anybody ship infinity with their products? Okay, I'd like to do a very quick demonstration here. I've got a, a 20 megahertz circuit board and I'm going to power it up with a battery pack. It uses AA batteries. Some of your products use larger power supplies than AA batteries. It has four, four signal layers. Some of your company's products use more than four signal layers. And it's a 20 megahertz oscillator. Most of you guys and gals have circuits that operate faster than 20 megahertz. And um, if I turn on an, AM, FM, an FM radio right next to my circuit board, you suddenly hear the noise go away. That going away is not good. That silence, that silence is not good, right? That's jamming, right? Oh my gosh, that's self, that's self jamming, that's desense on my wireless module. I can't ship my product, right? I'm, some digital circuit is interfering with the radio nearby. That's a hard problem. Passing the FCC or European Class A or Class B for radiated emissions, that's, oh, that's a huge signal, that's easy. That's hard, okay? So let's see, 20 megahertz oscillator. What's the frequency that FM radio is getting jammed up at? Anybody guess? Fifth harmonic, 100 megahertz, because the victim the victim has a very specific frequency response. This is an easy problem, right? 88 to 108 megahertz for an FM radio. So five times 20 is 100 megahertz, okay? So we, I, we talked about building a square wave out of number one, three, five, seven, nine. This is number five. It better be there, okay? And it is. The radio says so. The radio says, oh yeah, right? It's definitely being interfered with. All right, let's, let's, I want to investigate this one to infinity thing for a second. So fifth harmonic has got to interfere, guaranteed, right? If it's a square wave on the circuit board, if you trust me that there's a digital oscillator on the circuit board, this makes sense. So let me take a slightly more uh, expensive radio. It's not a very good radio. Um, it, only, it, it, it listens to very low and very high frequencies. It has a, a now out of production Radio Shack antenna. Can't buy these anymore, right? It's a terrible antenna, terrible radio. 
but it better pick up 100 megahertz. If it has 100 megahertz, it better pick up my, it better, are you listening to me? You better pick it up, otherwise I'm gonna be very unhappy with you. 100, please, there it is. So at 100 megahertz, boy, that, you, you had that laptop checked for emission? Okay, here's 200 megahertz. This is what, the 10th harmonic, right? 10, off, on, off, on. 10th harmonic, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of EMC engineers carry around with, that, with them a, a rough estimate that at least 10 times the fundamental ought to be present if I'm expecting a, dis, a, a decent fast edge in the frequency domain, right? So this is not surprising, neither was the <laughs> fifth, right? Nothing good yet, okay? Let's go up to 400 megahertz. 400 megahertz, that is 20 times, right? Off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. So, oh, that's a little more interesting, 20, 20 times, right? About 800 megahertz. Yeah, it's very quiet, right? What's that mean? It means, it means I'm, I'm not in the way. Okay. Off, on. Off, on. Okay, so that's the 40th harmonic. Now things are getting a little bit more interesting because if you're building a high-speed digital system and you, you know, infinity, you don't have to worry about infinity. You're not gonna ship that, but if you ship the 40th harmonic, well, you have to worry about maybe higher frequencies than you would for the regular old radiated emissions test, right? Because maybe the power at the 40th is quite a bit down from the power at the 10th, okay? So just a quick illustration. You know, Dsense is, it has been for years the big bane of people designing phones and wireless systems because it's a lot harder. But this problem maybe we can fix with low pass filtering at the source, right? The 40th harmonic? we could it, it make the amplitude of the 40th harmonic go to zero, and we would look at the, the, the picture on the scope and the time domain, and that signal would look just as good as it did before. I haven't proven that to you, but if we inspected the math, that would be true. Any questions about that? Okay, I just wanted to get in a couple of fun demonstrations uh, in, in all of the time that Mark gave me. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So uh, I, skipped, I skipped a little bit here because I, I, I knew I was coming into the boring, no, the fun stuff here. So you know we can represent a trapezoidal uh, periodic signal when we assume its rise time equals its fall time. We can represent it as, a, as, as, a, as a, a sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals. The fundamentals are sine waves, so on the frequency axis they look like lines. And um, yeah, we know that if we can make the, the edge time, the rise or fall time, the edge time slower, then we can make this frequency here lower, which means the amplitude of our, our lines will be weaker at higher frequencies. All this says is, here's how we see the strength of the harmonics depends on rise time when we get up to a certain frequency, right? And, and if you're really paying attention, when you saw me create the first graphs of the sine waves and the square wave, I only used one term. I wasn't even paying attention to rise time. I wasn't, using, uh, I, I wasn't using a term involving ed edge time. Yeah, I was only using a, uh, a, uh, a term that involved uh, fre frequency, right? So we learned uh, at birth that faster edge time causes stronger, higher frequencies. Higher frequencies allow smaller antennas to work well, and the strength of very high frequencies depends almost entirely on edge time. So uh, we could spend a lot of time on this and flush these details out with a little math. I'll try to do that quickly here. How many of you completely bored right now wish you hadn't come? Mark, shut up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm not going to listen to your presentation either. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, so here comes a little bit of math. We can learn quite a bit from this math. It's actually, actually useful. It's actually fun. Here's a sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals. The sum of cleverly chosen fundamental signals has, if we look at this coefficient here, this is the strength that C sub N, the N means the harmonic number. So that means C1, C2, C3, C4, through C5, right? Okay, 
if we take a look at these two terms here, here are the interesting terms. One depends on pulse width, so you see the capital T, that's the pulse width of the signal. And then one over here depends on uh, edge time. Here it's rise time, but the whole analysis depends on rise time equal to fall time and, and sort of more true than not, okay? And we take a look at these two terms and, and there's, there's two things that I want to pull out here that I want to point out to you. One is, uh, one is about the even harmonics, okay? If you take a look at, e, at this coefficient right here, and the numerator of this coefficient. If this coefficient becomes zero, then the whole C sub n becomes zero, right? Because you're going to multiply stuff by zero, you get zero out. So what's interesting is the numerator is going to go to zero sometimes. Uh, let's say that tau, the pulse width over the period t, is equal to a half. What does that mean? Pulse width over period is duty cycle. A pretty looking square wave has a duty cycle of 0 0.5, 50% on, 50% off, right? Okay, when that thing equals a half, what happens when we pick n, harmonic number, equal to an even number? When n is equal to 2, the second harmonic, we get 2 times pi times a half. That's the sine of pi. Sine of pi is 0. Sine of 2 pi is 0 when n is equal to 4. When n is equal to 6, sine of 3 pi. So in other words, if you can build a square wave with 50.0% duty cycle, even other harmonics go away. That's a cool demonstration to do. That requires two more boxes of equipment. Not going to happen today. Okay? But you, you can do this at, in your, your debug lab, you know, in your, your regular lab bench at work. Okay? So even order harmonics. But how many of you build systems with 50.0% duty cycle? Do you hear the question, right? Nobody raised their hands? Okay. 45, 55 is maybe what you get from your part specs. 50.0 is tough to come by. It's that last 1% actually that really matters. If you're really lucky to have a system that's hovering around 49.9, 50, 50.1, you're in for a very bad day in EMI troubleshooting because even harmonics are going to bounce up and down and you're going to go, huh? Unless you're, that would be a very bad day. Okay. So number one is this is how we can see that even order harmonics go away with 50% duty cycle, or how come we always get the story, the simplified story about why we only have odd harmonics in, we could build a digital square wave out of only odd harmonics. That's what's behind it, okay? Second thing, second thing to pull out of this is, um, uh, you know, this is the term that's going to control the strength of the very high frequency harmonics. How can we figure that out? Well, if you take a look at this form, it's really a sine x over x, right? Okay? Uh, sine x over x. For when, when x is equal to small, anybody remember what sine x over x is? Sine x over x is equal to about 1, right? But when, when, x, when, x is, when x is very small, right? It, when it's really, really small, close to 0, it's a value of 1, right? Now, now when, when, when it, I should say very, very small. When x is just very small, then we know that the, the, you know, sine x over x is going to be about uh, x over x is going to be about 1. Now, so in other words, in other words, when this numerator is really small, okay, now look at this. The numerators are identical except for pulse width versus rise time, right? How do we usually build square waves? If you're doing 2 and 3 and 5 gigahertz signaling on a circuit board, maybe we have to take a step back here. But if we restrict ourselves to below a gigahertz on a circuit board, usually why edge time, rise time or fall time is much less than pulse width, right? So who's got the small numerator? This guy here, right? What does that mean? He's, this guy is always equal to 1 until you get to a high, until it gets big. When does it get big? When n gets big. Notice this term only contributes 1 until you get to higher frequency harmonics. And then this is the guy whose value goes to, to a smaller and smaller number. This is the guy that controls the, the, the amplitude of the, of the um, higher frequency harmonics. That's the term with rise time. Okay, that's how the math talks to you. So there are other ways to, to, you know, you can calculate these out and prove it, but um, j j the, the, the stuff we got taught way back undergrad school, boy, it's very powerful if, if you get the right connection to, 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 you know, EMI design and troubleshooting, very helpful, keeps you from going down the wrong path in troubleshooting, keeps you from saying silly things, or you'll find it, like me, I'll find another way to say a silly thing, okay. So now we're going to talk about antennas. Um, a long time ago, um, I, I took classes from Dr. Todd Hubing up front, and uh, Dr. Hubing has great ways of talking about antennas. Um, 
Children have great ways of talking about antennas. If you're lucky enough to have children or you're thinking about them in the future, when they're really little, they start to acquire language, right? They start, they start the bad, 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 mama, dada, and then they start counting. One, two. You can do it too. One, two. Two pieces of metal makes a dipole antenna. My three-year-old could identify a dipole antenna. Once he started, once we got him to start talking, then it kept on talking. Okay, two pieces of metal. Good antennas must have both halves. I would say in general, uh, need to have, uh, you know, their, each half to be greater than, it always depends on how strong is the source. Uh, you know, I could say lambda over 10 or lambda over 20. They, they need to have some physical length, right? They need to have some physical length. Because you remember, in DC circuits class, if you were to connect a battery across the two arms here of this antenna, how much current would flow? Zero. This is in DC circuits class. They say this is an open circuit, right? Then you go to electromagnetics class or antennas class, and they say, "Oh no, that's an antenna. And currents flow on one side, come back on the other." Uh, so long as we have some significant electrical length, there. Otherwise, we're we're going to we're going to treat this as, as almost as an open circuit, right? Not not being an effective antenna. Um, a perfect uh, antenna, dipole antenna, is going to be a half wavelength from one, from one tip to the other. Um, one, one piece out of those two pieces then will be a half of that, will be a quarter wavelength. So that, that would be the ideal antenna. Now, somebody isn't measuring all the pieces of metal and cables on our product and making them all exactly a quarter wavelength. So we're not looking for pieces of metal or cables or wires that are all exactly the right length. We're just looking for ones that, that will be uh, long enough. So in EMI talk, we're not going to try to design exactly the right antenna or discard our suspicions of possible antennas by measuring them and saying, if you're not a quarter wavelength, you're not going to cause trouble. Our EMI talk is going to be, if it's way too short, that's going to be an inefficient antenna, something that's unlikely to cause a radiated emissions problem or cause a radiated immunity problem. But then we're, uh, uh, the right length antenna is going to be you know, an excellent antenna. You, you're definitely going to fail the EMI test. Um, but then, you know, this makes antenna designers a little crazy. Uh, we say if the antenna is long enough, it can still cause trouble. If it's, if it's long, so even if it's longer than a quarter wavelength, we're going to say, well, you know, it could still, there's a possibility. I'm, I'm not going to ignore that. Once I hook up the 100-foot Ethernet cable, I won't have a radiated emissions problem anymore because it's not a quarter wavelength that 100. No, we're, see, if it's long enough, we're going to say it's going to cause trouble. The only, the only structures we're going to maybe rule out are ones that are going to be much too small. And I'm just stating that here without, you know, without too much proof. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a slightly closer look at dipole antennas. Um, two pieces of metal, and uh, they're all around us. We uh, we just need to retrain our eyes. Mechanical engineers, in particular, any mechanical engineers in here? Not a single one. Okay. I wouldn't go to their fluid dynamics symposium anyway. <laughs> uh, two pieces of metal. Um, and, and so reminding how we're going to check out for their favorite lengths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wavelength, speed of light in the medium divided by frequency. So what about my um, 100 megahertz uh, FM radio? Uh, you know, my FM radio getting interfered with 100 megahertz. What does that mean? So I've got 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by 100 megahertz, right, which is 1 times 10 to the 8th. Uh, cycles per second, so that gives me a wavelength of three meters, right? And a half of that is 1.5 meters, right? And then um, one half of that is going to be uh, 75 uh, centimeter, right? Okay. Um, uh, another one of my other favorite antennas um, is uh, they're still being used today in automotive uh, automotive uh, industry. They sometimes call them the mast antenna, right? The piece of metal that sticks up out of the car body. Some cars still have them today. The other half of the car body is the, the other half of the antenna is the car body itself, because that's the second piece of metal, right? Some antenna people and ham radio people, they get out of control. Once the second piece of metal doesn't look like the first piece, they start giving it other crazy names. They call it a ground plane, they call it a, a, a radio, ground radio, a counterpoise, but it really is the second piece of metal. And those extra words don't help at all. They just, they're just a distraction. I'm looking for two pieces of metal, all right? So uh, some of you are old enough to have seen a metal antenna sticking up out of a car body and have it break off. And you know your car radio doesn't work anymore, right? It breaks off for various reasons, okay? So that would one reason why your FM radio in your car wouldn't work. Um, 
what if um, you bought a car, really nice car, really nice car, but um, you didn't upgrade, you got the factory radio. Somebody walks up to your car, they go, nice car, junky radio. They steal your car and they leave the radio behind. Now, assuming the radio still has got some internal power source, the radio doesn't receive signals because they took the second half of the antenna. You still need the car body, right? Second half. Okay, what if you're an EMI geek, right? I would probably qualify as one of those. I, that's all I, I like working on is, is electromagnetic compatibility. And you want to ruin the performance of somebody's FM radio in their car, broadcast radio. They're actually using the FM, the metal antenna sticking up out of their car. They're not hooked up to the satellite, listening to the satellite. You want to ruin the performance of the antenna, but you don't want the person to notice that you've messed it up. You want to do a secret little, uh, you know, sabotage. What do you do? When the guy's not in his car, you walk up to the car, and right where the rod antenna sticks up out of the car, you go scrape a little paint off the top of the car, and then you take a very, very tiny wire, so small they can't even see, and you connect the base of the mast to the, the metal of the car. What does that do? Yeah, if you like Mr. Thevenin, and you've shorted the antenna, now you only have one piece of metal, right? If you're Mr. Norton, you have redirected the current back to, you know, back towards the outside world, to where the field induced that current, right? This, you can think about, you can say, oh, I ru ruined his transmitting antenna, I redirected the current back to the source, or I shorted out the two pieces of metal that the, you know, the transmitter, tra you can think of this as for emissions or immunity, right? Either way, right? So you ruin the performance of that guy's antenna by, by creating that short circuit. Hey, that sounds familiar. Hold on to that thought for a second. That, that sounds like a very familiar, uh, familiar thing. Um, so let's, now that we recognize um, uh, th you know, these you know, theoretical dipole antenna, let's take a look at a real product. Now, some of your products will not have a conductive enclosure around. How many of you are, for everybody in the room here, if you're working at a company that develops hardware, how many of your, how many of your companies produce hardware with a conductive enclosure? Okay, so still quite a few, all right? So uh, I got a conductive enclosure. It doesn't mean it has to be metal. It could be painted. could have some metal embedded in the plastic. I got a circuit board inside. You probably do too, right? Here's a wire leaving the box. Or in my case, about 15 years ago, working on a really low frequency fiber channel system on fiber optic cable, only at 625 megahertz, there's a little metal spring inside of the fiber optic plug. When the fiber optic cable plugs in, the radiated emissions go up. And I tell my customer, what? That's not right. The radiated emissions don't go up when you add glass. There's no conductor in the glass. You, you were smoking something. That can't possibly be right. But after we x-ray the cable, we find a little metal spring inside the fiber optic plug. So it might be a little piece of metal sticking out of the box. Might be a piece of plumbing if we're cooling a DC to DC inverter or a motor or something we're trying to drive around. It could be anything, it could be any kind of piece, any metal. We talk about cables and wires a lot, but just a wire is a piece of metal and we call it a, a wire. We could call it something else. So we got a wire leaving the box. We got two pieces of metal, right? We got wire and box. This is the antenna that keeps me employed. Number one antenna for radiated emissions and radiated immunity is the wire against the box. And so using this, this crazy little sabotage idea of shorting the wire to the box, what do you use on a circuit board to do that? What component, electrical component do we use? Use capacitors sometimes to short the wire to the box? I would like to directly short all the wires to the box. If they carry electricity, I'm not allowed to do that. But I would like to connect them directly by, if it's plumbing, right, or if it's a spring, if it's a, a mechanical structure, I can do that. If it's an electrical structure that needs to have a unique voltage on and current, maybe I can't do that. If it's DC return on a power supply, maybe I'm allowed to do that. That would be cool, right? And the rest of the wires, I use capacitors. Make sense? Very basic ideas about antennas. All right, any questions? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about inductance, really quick. Okay, how many of you, this is fun, whenever I teach a class, one of my favorite topics. And um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. I called myself an EMC engineer for six years. I could not find inductance if you paid me. Uh, if I ordered an inductor from DigiKey, I would go, aha, that, that's the inductor. Yep, yep, five microhenry inductor. But then if you had me look on your circuit board or in your cable and you asked me to find the inductance, 
if it wasn't a labeled part, if it wasn't labeled L1, I couldn't find it. Can you imagine an EMC engineer that can't identify inductance? You, you, it's one of the four noise coupling paths. You can't find, if noise problems are evenly distributed across paths, <laughs> then you can't find a quarter of all EMI problems unless you kind of bump into them because you have no idea what you're looking for. So let me do a double check with you, everybody in the group. How many of you are very comfortable with the idea that a piece of wire has a unique value of inductance? How many of you are very comfortable with that idea? Okay, about a quarter, okay, that's totally wrong. <laughs> Let's, I'm gonna talk about that very quickly, but that, that means you can't find inductance in circuit boards uh, and connectors, or if you can find the inductance, it means that you do not have, the, you, you do not have an instinctive uh, path to reduce that inductance. Because if you're just focused on the wire, you're missing all of the fun. Okay, so let's, uh, this is, a, I've given you little pieces uh, from the class that I teach on, on electromagnetic compatibility. So some of these are pretty well worn, well, well uh, practiced. So I, I convinced my boss to buy a $50,000 NIST calibrated inductance meter. You, you, when it, because you bought it, you believe it. It tells you the right answer, right? <laughs> and it's got a red button. It announces inductance with, by talking Okay, and you hook up this one inch piece of wire, you connect it to a piece of metal, and you push the button. The inductance meter says, the inductance of this circuit is 10 nano Henry. And you go, aha, see, one, piece of, it, one inch piece of wire, 10 nano Henrys. It says so when it's calibrated. Pieces of wire do have inductance. But then, then I said, well, wait a minute, what if we take our thumb and we push down on that wire? What if we, we change its position in space? It's still connected to that green piece of metal, you can't help but call it a ground plane, right? Don't have to call it a ground plane, just a piece of metal. Now we push the measurement button on the inductance meter. Does the inductance meter say greater, less, or the same? Less. less. So for some of you, if, if the less part is intuitive, awesome, right? Because now you have, now if you said that inductance is a property of a, if a, unique, if a piece of wire has a unique value of inductance, and then you said that when you change the position of the wire, it's inductance change, now you're really, it's kind of hurting because you're trying to stand in two places at, right? And you're trying to say it, the length of the wire has, that piece of wire has a unique value of inductance, and then you just change its position in space and you got a new value. That doesn't sound right, right? So what did you change? You changed loop area, right? You change loop area. That's, that's, where the, that's, that's the self-inductance that we're really interested in. That's the inductance we're interested in is the, the magnetic flux that gets added up inside of that loop, okay? Try that at home. Try that at your, in your lab. So we change H. So, um, so really quickly on inductance, uh, I gotta make sure I keep time here. I got 15 minutes off. Um, inductance is the stuff you get for the current that, that you uh, put in, the, the stuff for the current, okay? Um, if you don't like math, <laughs> you came to the wrong place. No, turn your head for a second. You don't like math. <laughs> okay, what's, what's total magnetic stuff? Well, come on, it's just the stuff per area. It's the stuff density added, over, added up over an area, right? And we're not sure if the magnetic density, magnetic stuff density is constant or not. So we keep it under the integral. And we, we, we imagine a current flowing on our thumb, going, flowing through a loop, and we add up the magnetic stuff going through that loop, right? And that gives us a value. But your calculus teacher will tell you, you must be careful that, that integral is only defined when the surface has a closed contour, right? That it has to be a bounded surface. Otherwise, you don't know what area to add up. That's the key. You have to know what the boundary is of that surface. You must know it. So what's the boundary? So if we're trying to add up, trying to add up some stuff flowing through our loop, you know, with our loop of current, right? That the boundary for the adding up of the stuff is the current. The current defines the boundary. So if we don't have a closed loop of current, we don't have a defined amount of self-inductance. That's why it doesn't make sense to talk about the inductance of a piece of wire. We don't know over what area to add up the stuff. If we can't add up the stuff, we can't define the inductance. That, so pieces of wire by themselves don't have a unique value, okay? Um, another way of getting at this is, if you don't like the math, is to say, well, I, yeah, the calculus, I, that's not going to work for me, I don't get it. Um, well, there was this law that you might have learned in school, right, after Maxwell's equations, or maybe it was derived from Maxwell's equations, conservation of charge or continuity of current, you can't create or destroy electrons, right? So if you say that a piece of wire has a unique value of inductance, that means you have some stuff for some current, okay? Current, all right, got some stuff, I got that. But current, what does that mean? If you have a piece of wire, that means, bam, out of nowhere, you created 10 amps of current. 
at the beginning of the wire. And then at the other, other end of the wire, bam, you went from 10 amps to zero. You went from zero to 10 at the beginning of the wire and from 10 amps to zero at the other end of the wire. You created and then you destroy charge. You're not allowed to do that. So talking about a piece of wire having a unique value of self-inductance doesn't make sense. It's just an another way to talk about it. So we've got to find a loop. Okay, that's a, not a lot of time here. I'm going to go as maybe a little tiny faster. Um, one of the things I was supposed to talk about was uh, path of least impedance in circuit boards. Um, if we take a look at on a circuit board, here we've got a trace, and we imagine that we're over a continuous plane. We're expanding the idea of inductance, and we're looking at circuit boards. So that's kind of the flow of the talk right now. Inductance, now here's, here's how we, we use inductance to predict the position of current in circuit boards. Um, current takes a path of least impedance. Uh, least impedance, resistance plus inductive reactance. If F is really, really small, this is DC circuits class. Current takes a path of least resistance, right? If F is really, really big, if F is really, really big, and we're talking about good conductors, then 2 pi FL will dominate. So that means at very low frequencies, current seeks the path of least resistance. It spreads out to get greatest uh, area. And at very high frequencies, a current will take the path of least uh, inductance, which means it wants to close the smallest possible loop. So at low frequencies, we would expect this current to spread out, spread out across the, the, this uh, plane. And at high frequencies, we would expect the current to be uh, just a shadow, a projection of the current onto the plane above or below. Many of you know this story from signal integrity classes or, 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 or studies that you've, you've, you've done on your own. So low frequencies in general on circuit boards would be well below, uh, it would be 100 kilohertz or so or less and high frequencies would be well above that. So at low frequencies, the current will spread out. At high frequencies, the current will not. So at high frequencies, if the current doesn't spread out, that would, that would beg the question, why would I want to split up a plane if the return current is automatically going to be positioned with respect to where the signal trace is, right? The return current position is controlled by the position of the trace. We, we better not mess with the position of that high frequency return current by cutting up a plane. If we do, then by definition, we've added inductance. The current will naturally seek the path of least inductance. We can't help it. Right? At low frequencies, we might be able to, to, to control the position of the current and not dramatically affect the, the operation of that circuit, but not at high frequencies. Okay? So we're going to talk a little, little, little bit more about inductance. And then, um, a little bit more about inductance, and then we're going to um, uh, walk into Maxwell's equations really quickly. When signal goes through an inductance, it creates a noise voltage drop, either a self-inductance drop or what we normally call you know, transformer coupling, where we, we have a coupled, we have one, one loop coupling a second loop. EMC engineers, we either hate them if we can't fix the problem, or we love them because we stay employed when we can fix the problem. So it depends on how you look at that. So one, one interesting application of this idea of inductive coupling creating radiated emissions uh, formed the, the basis of, uh, of uh, some very important research that was done um, back in the late 80s and early 90s at what was then the University of Missouri Rolla. Uh, Todd Hubing here was one of the authors that talked about how current on a circuit board creates a, a magnetic flux which then couples uh, the wires connected to the circuit board. We can think of that as a transformer. We have, and I introduced this topic to you before, earlier. We have a signal loop, that's what we're calling the trace and the path back on the ground plane of the circuit board. So we have a current flowing out the trace and coming back in the plane. We have a second loop which, is in, in, which actually looks like a, uh, our favorite dipole antenna with a little bit of capacitance across the arms. What we're really saying is that when we have current, if I go back to our little idea of, of our wire leaving the box, here's our wire and here's our box, and we send a noise current out the wire, that, that current actually, we can imagine that current returning to the box through a little bit of capacitance in the air. That's actually what we would call a displacement current, right? If I took a dipole antenna and instead of drawing the two arms out, like, like this, right? If I took a dipole antenna and I put the arms like this, everybody would be comfortable seeing a capacitance between these two arms, right? And, and I bet all of you are very comfortable with looking at a circuit where there's a capacitor in series with a resistor, and I ask you, at, at, you know, for AC signals, 
what does the current flow look like in that circuit? You would all say, well, it goes through the capacitor, goes through the resistor, and gets back. Everybody would look at the capacitor as a path for current, right? So what I'm asking you to do is to take a look at the dipole antenna and see that when the arms are really close together, it resembles a capacitor. So it's, it's natural to see a current going out to one piece of metal and then showing up on the other piece of metal. Just like in my simple RC circuit where you see current flowing through a capacitor, right? So if I move the arms farther and farther away, you, you, you still see an arm here and an arm here. You still see sort of some capacitance here. It's a little bit harder to imagine that when I show you the dipole like this. But what I'm asking you to imagine is, yeah, I can see a path for a current to flow through the air from one arm to another. That allows me to take my dipole model and, and, and show a loop showing current flowing out the wire, returning to my metal box, showing the current flowing out the wire, returning to the other side of the dipole antenna. So what I've done is in, in, in one minute, which would usually take, I usually go slowly in a half an hour, is to say, we've got a current loop, here's a primary, and it's going to talk to a secondary, and that's how we end up with currents on the wires attached to a circuit board. So uh, what I'd like to do is show you that very, very quickly here with my PC board. And, um, and it's right. It, if you haven't seen this before, it, uh, it's, it, 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 it is, uh, you, would think that it's, you would think that it's magic. You, you need to show this to a high school or college intern, okay? You, you say, here's my circuit board. It's got a battery pack plugged into it, right? And I've got a couple of pieces of, I've got two alligator clips that are connected together, right? And I'm going to connect the, the, uh, this uh, alligator clip to this metal connector, which is attached to the ground plane of the circuit board. So what I'm doing is I'm attaching the wire to the ground plane of the circuit board, right, through the metal connector. And I've got a 20 megahertz oscillator and a battery plaque on the PC board, just as a reminder. You ask the high school stu student or the college student, you ask them, how much current flowing on this ground wire? They go look at you and you go, well, what do you mean? It's a ground wire and it stops, it's zero. Of course it's zero, right? Um, and you say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Yet. I, let's, oh, I, you tell them, well, no, I, I don't think it's here. It was actually, there's some amount of current on that wire. Go and go use spice. Go home and homework assignment. Go use spice and calculate the amount of current on this wire. Now they're giving you down eyebrows, right? And if you've got kids, you're going to do like, oh, I don't know what you mean. How do, how do I do that? So in other words, we, we got some explaining to do. If we're going to hook up a piece of wire to GND on the circuit board, and I'm going to use a current probe. What I'm going to try to do now is also is to um, collapse uh, a couple of slides that I'm going to talk, talk about. I'm going to try to collapse them into a, a lot less time here by going straight to this demonstration. What I'm going to do is take a current probe. So, any of you used a current probe before? OK. Yeah, this is a high frequency current probe. A current flows through the hole in the probe. A current goes through the probe. It creates a magnetic flux, right? Mr. Ampere figured that out, right? That, uh, that electricity cr creates uh, magnetism, right? Mag creates a magnetic field. Current creates a magnetic field. So we got current, we got magnetic flux. It's circulating around in a circle, right? The, the core of this uh, current probe is made out of a, 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 per a, a permeable magnetic material. It likes magnetic stuff. So we get stuff running around in the toroid. Then what do we do? We put a wire, we put a secondary around, let's not even call it a secondary, we put a winding around the toroid, right? Now the, the coil of the toroid sees some flux, the coil wrapped around the toroid sees some flux flowing through it, right? That's Mr. Faraday. Magnetism creates electricity. We've got some flux inducing a voltage, right? Now the voltage goes down the spectrum analyzer, and we're going to go measure something, I hope. Okay? So I'm going to show you, the, uh, show you a spectrum analyzer here. Um, there's a little bit of overscan, but um, what, we're, we're, what I'm just showing you is 10 megahertz to 310 megahertz. Okay? Now when you do lab experiments in school, hopefully somebody told you uh, before you do the measurement, you should have an idea of what you're going to measure. Otherwise, you're going to record gibberish, right? You're going to record junk. What should we see? If my story is right, we should see 20, 40, 60. We should see regularly spaced lines. Oh, you mean there's current on that piece of wire? Oh, that GND wire has current. How do we explain that with a SPICE model? We have a little bit of work to do, right? We have current flowing on a, in a signal loop causing a voltage drop across the ground plane of the circuit board, and that voltage is pushing current out on the wire. Okay, so I've now skipped to some of the later slides in the, in the class because I've got about four minutes left. So I just want to talk about the current probe is now 
a, 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 um, is, is using f Ampere's law. C current creates magnetism, right? Uh, we have magnetic flux rotating around the toroid inside of this current probe. And then that flux flows through the, the coil wrapped around the, the, the core in the probe. And that creates voltage, a time changing voltage which the spectrum analyzer can measure, right? So we are measuring current out on this wire attached to the circuit board. We've got three minutes. So uh, we're regularly spaced. Let me m make sure that it's this circuit board. Let's turn the circuit board on and off. Ready? Off, on. Oh, oh, look, that's definitely the circuit board, right? Regu regularly spaced. What do we know about antennas? What if we change their length? If we change their length, if I make an antenna shorter, it works worse at long or low frequencies, right? So I'm going to make the antenna shorter. If this is really a signal loop coupling to an antenna, I change the length of the wire, I change the input impedance of the antenna, I should be able to change the amplitude versus frequency response. That is not what the output of a 20 megahertz oscillator looks like. It does not look like small, big, 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 small, small. It does not look, if you look, that's not right. This spectrum depends on the inductive coupling from the primary to the secondary, and it depends on the length of the wire, right? That's how, that's how we convert this, convert this uh, situation into a simple model. So if I change the length of the wire, what we'd expect is this resonant frequency here, which I think is at, uh, probably at 80 megahertz. Maybe it'll go up. Let's see, I'm gonna detach the wire, ready? And Oh, you brought your equipment to the MI test lab and somebody gave you a different length internal flex cable. Oh, don't worry, that will matter. Right? right? So the length of the cables attached to your product, you've already found this out, right? It can have a profound impact on radiated emissions and radiated immunity. We would see that by modeling those cables, maybe as a simple dipole antenna and saying, what happens when we change the length? We change the resonant length. Now, if we measure this current in advance, we, have an we will have an idea of its radiated emissions performance, right? Because the current on the antenna tells me the strength of the field. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. The current in Maxwell's equations tells me the E and the H in Maxwell's equations, right? So if we know how much, if we got a lot of current here, we got a big radiated emissions problem. If we got a tiny, tiny bit of current, maybe we don't have any radiated emissions problem. And for sure it can change, it can depend on the, on the length of our attached wires. Okay, hope you enjoyed the talk and please stay tuned right away for Dr. Todd Hubing. Thank you.